and the 18th verse the words of Jesus I like the words of Jesus don't you they used to say on TV that when Charles Swab talked everybody paid attention well, I feel sorry for them he went bankrupt so if they were listening to him they probably did too but when Jesus talks we need to pay attention and in this uh, 18th verse he's talking to Peter and he's saying I say also unto thee that thou art Peter he knew him by name and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this rock I'm going to build my church except the Lord build the house all the political correctness and programs are in vain except the Lord keep the city and the church it is as nothing but I'm going to build my church Jesus said and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it that thrills me because I believe the church is getting a bad rap today. I still believe in the Lord's church. I still believe he's building it. I'm aware that many and most churches are in decline, are splitting, disagreeing, going down, but not his church. You see, there's a difference in his church than the rest. They're building theirs on entertainment, on contemporary things that won't last, that's meaningless. Their foundations are crumbling and decaying but his foundation is standing sure because he's the one that birthed the church Jesus is the one that baptized the church with the Holy Ghost the third person of the Godhead and he's the one that's coming back for his bride, the church. I was holding a revival in Springfield, Ohio, a few years ago, and happened to be in the church that uh, Reverend Nelson Purdue was saved in and grew up in as a, as a kid. His sister still goes there, or did, and uh, real small church small crowd country church and uh, as we would uh, go for revival the pastor told me he said now pastor Bow, we don't have much music we don't have very many people so I graciously invited Brenda to do his music And when she was informed, she immediately declined. <laughs> well, he was a wonderful friend of both of ours. And I said, well, you know, Mom, I shouldn't speak for you. But deep down, I knew I should if I was going to get her to do it. So 
so if you don't want to do that, just call him and tell him. <laughs> so she done the music for me, this revival, and it was great. But there was about an 80, 85 year old man that they picked up from the nursing home that had rheumatoid arthritis and oh, it just, he was in so much pain. But he came to service every night. And he took a liking to Brenda. And he would go and talk to her before the service started and talk to her before it was over. And I was headed for the platform one evening and he was talking to her and I heard him say this. You know, Sister Bauer, when the Lord saved me, I determined right then and there that I was going to avail myself of the church and its services no matter how I felt. I listened because, see, I'm not used to hearing stuff like that. You do know what I'm used to hearing, don't you? Oh, my back hurts, my head hurts, my knee hurts, my, my leg hurts, and, you know. And so I pray for them and they must receive a wonderful miracle because they go to work the next morning. Hmm. But I'm telling the story here. And he said, I've been laying on a heating pad all day because my back's hurting. And I watched him during the service and if you've ever had back trouble, you know you can tell whether a person's hurting or not. And he was hurting. And when I got home that night, I said, Lord, bless him and help him to be able to come to the services without pain. He loves the church so much. Let me ask you this morning. I'm going to preach a message on cherishing the church. Cherishing the church. Do you cherish the church? Do you reverence and respect the church? Across our land, many and most don't. Now, we want you to come to church no matter what you think and, and, and what you do. But I'll never put a sign out on our lawn, come just as you are. You can do that. But I'd rather if you came to the house of God... You put on something nice out of respect and reverence, not to me or man, but you're going into God's house. Amen. I'd rather that you not eat your breakfast in the service because when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to feed you right. heavenly things. Breakfast is a place to be ate at home. Let me ask you just something to think about. Do you give your time and your talents and the Lord's tithe to the church? You know why some don't? You are asking me that in your mind, aren't you? I, I can read it. <laughs> I'm glad you're asking me that so I can tell you. They don't cherish the church. You see, if you cherish the church, you realize that it's the only institution 
that the Lord ever established that the gates of hell could not prevail against. You say, preacher, they can't prevail against the home. Are you kidding? Have you taken a good look at our homes today? And what's happening to them? And how they're divided? And how there's so much defiance and uh, disorder in the home today? The church is the only institution where Jesus said, be a part of it. I'm going to birth it. I'm going to baptize it. I'm going to build it. And I'm coming for it. It's my bride. We've come a long way from where the church is supposed to be. The church is three things this morning. And the first one is this. It's a place where love abounds. Amen. It's a place where love abounds. And you know why that's so? It's because the Lord's in charge of it. And God is love. The love of God has to come first in the church. We're to love him before we love ourselves. We're to love him before we love others. We're to love him before we love our families. In fact, Jesus said, if you love your family more than me, you really don't love me. You've got to seek first the kingdom of God. You know, it's a place where love abounds for God and for our families. I'm amazed this morning, stricken with uh, amazement at the lack of love that I hear and see that's going on in our families. And people will say they love their husband or, or they love their wife and then they'll talk mean to them or they'll ignore them, just keep looking up here. Nobody's come to my office this week and told me about you. But he knows about you. And God put the family together. Till death do us part. You see, I think uh, when we think about our families, that some people forget the part where they told God in sickness and in health to love and to cherish till death do us part. Thanksgiving season, I was telling Brenda uh, this week, no child should be left behind or left out of a Thanksgiving dinner with their mom and dad. It's a shame to gather around the table and have the family fragmented. But when we come together as a church, it's our brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And we love it. Excuse the expression, we eat like pigs. <laughs> and we talk nonstop because we love the family. There's nothing like the family of God. There's no institution that you can walk into and go into that loves people like the church. I don't know how many uh, men and women I've seen leave the worship services that didn't claim to be Christians 
But yet they picked up on that spirit of love that abounded in the services. And they looked at their mate and said, boy, those people really love the Lord and love one another, don't they? I don't know how many times when people are fussing and fighting won't sit on the same side of the aisle won't speak to somebody in the church that even sinner people think wonder what's wrong with him how so and so I'll say I don't know they wouldn't speak to me in church <clears throat> The church is a place where we love one another. Where we love God and where we love our neighbor as ourselves. Do you love yourself? We don't have to preach to people to love theirself. It's evident. They take care of three people in their life. Still listening? Say amen. amen. Me, myself, and I. And that's why Jesus said love your neighbor as yourself love your friends love one another love is the most excellent way you say preacher I just can't hardly endure some of my family or my friends love endures love sustains love boasts not itself Love is not envious or jealous. Read the first chapter, of, uh, read 1 Corinthians 13. Love strengthens, love uh, cherishes. Here's what I like about love. It don't behave itself unseemingly. You would think that the church would be the last place that you would ever hear or witness bad behavior. Brenda tells me all the time, I've pastored for 45 years, I'd like to read the book that you wrote. I said, oh, it'd be a bestseller. Because I've seen a lot of bad behavior take place in the church. But if we love one another, the Bible says, love seeks not our own, does not behave itself unseemingly, and is not puffed up. It vaunteth not itself. I guess that's why I love the church. I love to get to the church because love abounds. You may be treated bad in your home life. You may be uh, treated terrible at work. But when I walk through the door, I sense his presence. Amen. And I know yes. this is the place where love abounds. Yes, right. For you see, it is the temple of the Holy Ghost, God Almighty. And we are standing in his presence on holy ground. Amen. The second thing the church is, is not only a place where love abounds, it's a place where forgiveness is granted. Yes. And we all need it. Yes. It's a place where forgiveness is granted. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all said things in a moment of emotion that we wish we could take back. We've all done things that if we could just redo them they'd never be done. Little boy got mad at his brother. A 
and chewed his brother out. And when it got time for bedtime, they had to say the prayers. And she had taught them the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And the one little brother that had been wrong said to his little brother, said, I forgive you for what you said about me. And he kissed him on the cheek. Continued to say his prayers. And when the other little brother got to the part in the Lord's Prayer where it says, forgive us of our trespasses or our debts, as we forgive our debtors, he stopped. And he said, wait a minute, Mommy. And he took off and he ran in his bedroom. And Mommy went to see what he was doing. And he had knocked every one of his brother's little soldiers off of his stand. He was picking them up and putting them back in their place. When he finished, he ran back in and knelt down and he said, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. <laughs> what are you trying to say? I believe it's easier for kids to forgive than it is for adults. For some reason, even though God granted forgiveness to you and me, we won't forgive the people we love. They're not perfect. Sometimes they're going to hurt your feelings. Sometimes they're going to do things that don't suit you. And Peter said, well, Lord, when that happens, I'll forgive them, but uh, that old line runs short. How many times do you want me to forgive them? Jesus said, Peter, you want me to forgive them seven times? He thought he was doing something big. And the Lord said, Peter, I not only want you to forgive them seven times, but seven times seventy. And as many times as they turn to you in spirit and in truth and ask forgiveness, I want you to grant it. That's tough, preacher. How many times God have to forgive you? Did you quit doing it the first time he forgave you? Or did you find yourself doing it again? And again. And again. And even thinking, I've had people ask me, Preacher, will God forgive me? This is so many times. The church is a place where God's forgiveness is granted. Freely forgiven unconditionally over and over again. The sweetest words we sing about or preach in the church is I forgive. You see in the church there's a sea of forgetfulness where those mistakes and those sins and those faults and those failures are all bundled up and cast in the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more. In every church I've ever pastored, I've had several young married couples, some middle-aged, a few elderly, who have been hurt in their marriage. And they were deciding, they were at the crossroads, which way to go. And before I quit marital counseling, there was a man and woman in my office and he had sinned and 
he'd committed adultery and they had three kids and it all come out and it was a mess. And he had gotten saved at the altar that Sunday morning. She'd kicked him out of the house, <laughs> threw his clothes out in the yard. He picked them up and took them to Mama's. Mama was in my church too. And he felt because he got saved, he'd get up and everything would be okay. And he'd just whistle his way back home. She locked the doors and had had the locks changed. He couldn't get in. He went back to Mamba's and he said, Mom, she won't let me in. Did you tell her you got saved? Yeah. Still didn't get in. Getting saved is a wonderful thing. But it doesn't undo everything that's been done forgiven sometimes not forgotten and so in my office the next morning I said Debbie you've got a big decision to pray about what's that Pastor Bauer you've got to pray since Darren's been saved whether you're going to forgive him and put that in the sea of forgetfulness never to bring it back up never to remember it no more against him or you're going to have to let him go on his way he's committed adultery on you and you're going to have to build a new life but whatever life you decide you need to forgive him. You have three children by him. Well, he didn't like that device, even though it was biblical. And he went and told his mom. The bad thing about that was she was my treasure. <laughs> she signed my paycheck and I needed my paycheck. <laughs> and she called me and I said, now Marilyn, hang up right now. I didn't want to counsel those kids but you just insisted do you remember what I told you when you insisted only on one condition that you and her dad keep their nose out of it and I expect you to do that <laughs> they got back together the long story is they finally got divorced the church is a place where forgiveness is granted Jesus said thy sins are forgiven thee I'm not here to point them out I'm not here uh to expose your sin I already know what it is just go and sin no more there's forgiveness with the Lord and there's also forgiveness with his children he said I've forgiven you and I expect you to forgive others and if you cannot forgive those who've sinned against you, listen to what he's saying here. Because, man, it's meaty. It's theological. If you cannot forgive those who've sinned against you, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you of your sins the church is a place where forgiveness is granted 
I wish I could tell you as the song leader comes and musicians come that, that the family and the home was a place where forgiveness was granted. But I'm not going to tell you that. You know why? Because I've seen too many families and too many homes that are divided because of non-forgiveness. Jesus has something to say about that. Are you still listening? A house divided against itself is not going to stand. The church is a place where faith abounds, number three. Now, I didn't say feelings, did I? I said the church is a place where faith abounds. And we're told to have faith in God. That unless we're willing to do that, it's impossible to please Him. We're saved by faith. We're kept by faith. We're healed by faith. We live by faith. The church is a place where we're delivered by faith. Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you. That if you have faith as the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can remove mountains. Oh, ye, Jesus said to his disciples, when they failed, when they were defeated. Oh, ye of little faith, according to, Lord, why couldn't we heal that boy? He said, this kind comes through much prayer and fasting, according to your faith, be it unto you. The church is a place where faith abounds. Did she do you wrong? Yeah. Did he do you wrong? Yeah. It's not about who did what. The church is a place <laughs> where faith in God. You know what the disciples said? Man, he laid it out to them. And it stung because of what they'd have to do and how they'd have to live. and So they looked at him and said, Lord, increase our faith. We're going to have to have more. We're going to have to have our faith increased. Heavenly Father, help us this morning. There's people here that need help individually. There are marriages here that need help. There are homes here that need help. There are young people. There are dads, there are moms, there are families that need help in this Sunday morning service. Help them to seek you while you may be found and call upon you while you're near. In Jesus' name we pray.